so my name is Michelle Seng, and I, um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an assistant professor uh, in ecology here at the University of British Columbia in the departments of botany and zoology. Yeah, I uh, started in Ontario, so I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto in ecology and evolution, and then um, I stayed in Toronto to do a master's degree, um, and then moved to the US. I went to Indiana University for a PhD where I worked on uh, host parasite coevolution with mosquitoes, and and then came here to UBC for a postdoc where, and I stayed in sort of disease ecology and evolution and worked on caterpillars and viruses. And um, I actually took a break from academia for a little bit and worked in science publishing for many years, I think seven, eight, nine years, and then um, came back into science as a research associate in a lab, and then luckily there was a retirement here and they were hiring um, in a position where the, that I, I had expertise in, so I applied and, and, and got the job. So now, here I am. Yeah, so in general, our lab is super interested in how do ecological communities respond to climate change. And by, by climate change, there's a lot going on with climate change. There's changes in precipitation, there's flooding, there's um, extreme temperatures. We're mainly, mainly focused on temperature warming, so how, does, how are ecological communities responding to temperature? And um, we do, we mainly work on invertebrates, so both aquatic invertebrates um, and terrestrial. So on the aquatic side, we work on phytoplankton and zooplankton. We try, we ask these questions in phytoplankton and zooplankton. And then on the terrestrial side, we ask these questions in um, insects. We're very interested in aquatic ecosystems. And so in, we know that oceans and lakes are warming the temperature of the water is warming quite rapidly. And um, so in freshwater lakes, the base of the aquatic ecosystem are phytoplankton and zooplankton. And we know that these organisms have huge population sizes and fast generation times. So we're assuming that they're adapting both sort of through phenotypic plasticity as well as through evolutionary change. Um, so our goal has been to try to figure out you know, how are these organisms adapting and how quickly are they changing in response to warming? And then what are the larger sort of community level implications of, of this um, adaptation, both through phenotypic plasticity and through, and through um, evolutionary change? So one example is um, with phytoplankton, we grew a species of phytoplankton at different temperatures and we um, and we're sort of assuming that because phytoplankton have larger population sizes and faster generation times than zooplankton the phytoplankton will should evolve faster to warming than zooplankton do and so that potentially creates this mismatch between your food has already adapted to warming but you haven't adapt to, adapted to warming so what are the consequences of that mismatch? And so that's the question we were trying to address with this one particular study. Um, so we grew, we grew phytoplankton at different temperatures. We, so we were assume, um, for a long time, many generations and many months. Um, and then we were, at the same time, we were feeding those phytoplankton to zooplankton who were also um, growing at these different temperatures. So what we found was that um, the phytoplankton did evolve quite rapidly to warming. And how, what does that mean actually? So usually when you grow invertebrates at warmer temperatures, a few things happen for sure. One is that they usually are smaller in body size. Um, and so we saw that, we saw an evolutionary response to, of uh, smaller cells for the phytoplankton that were grown at the warmer temperature. 
So we saw um, evolutionary response also in um, respiration rates, but not in photosynthetic rates, which is also what kind of what we expected because we know from previous studies that photosynthesis evolves much more slowly than respiration does. Um, and what was really interesting too is that when we fed those different evolving lines of phytoplankton to zooplankton, so the cold evolving line and the warm evolving line, um, the zooplankton that were fed the cold evolving algae, they did a lot better. They had um, larger population sizes and they actually, their own evolutionary response to warming was faster when they were being fed the cold algae than when they were being fed the warm algae. And to that, that was a really exciting result because it was showing that this rapid evolution in the phytoplankton was, had immediate effects on the evolutionary potential of the zooplankton. And we think the reason for that is because when you grow phytoplankton at colder temperatures, they make more of these essential fatty acids called omega-3 fatty acids. And um, zooplankton that are deficient in those fatty acids tend not to have as many offspring and they grow slower and they just don't do as well. And so the zooplankton, what we think what was happening is that the zooplankton that were being fed these cold, colder evolved algae or phytoplankton, um, they had more dietary um, omega-3 fatty acids and they actually attained higher population sizes and um, when we measured rates of evolution at the end, they actually had responded more quickly to um, warming temperatures than the zooplankton that were being fed these, these warm grown algae. Um, after we, we were pretty excited about that result and we were able to get that result published. And then afterwards, we've sort of done a few follow-up studies to test, to actually measure fatty acids and nutrients that were, are being produced by um, cold reared and warm reared algae. And we do see that effect where the cold reared phytoplankton um, across multiple species actually, they always make more of these essential fatty acids than when you grow them at warmer temperatures. So this is sort of a line of um, sort of climate change ecological responses that we're really interested in is that, so why, like how quickly do these changes happen? So when you, when algae are warmed up, they make fewer of these fatty acids. Um, but how, you know, how transient is that effect? Like when you, if you warm the water up, say in the summer, and then cool it back down in the winter, they, they will make more of those fatty acids right away. And so we're trying to think about um, with climate change, what will be the net effect of maybe increases in temperature variation or increases in mean temperature on overall um, nutrient production in this, this base of the aquatic ecosystem? Um, and one thing I'll add is that sort of the mechanism for why, why do phytoplankton make um, fewer of these fatty acids when it's in warmer temperatures. We think that's because of membrane fluidity. And so other people, not our lab, other people for decades now have shown that when you, um, when cells are growing at colder temperatures, they need more of these long chain fatty acids to keep their membranes fluid. And then when you crank up the temperature, um, they don't need as they don't need to make as many of these fatty acids, um, and so interestingly, those fatty acids are there. They they make the membranes more fluid, but they're they're also a really nutritious um, dietary like um, uh, nutrient that that zooplankton and other organisms um, need, and actually the the. The healthy fats that you and I, if you eat fish, the healthy fats that you and I get from fish all originally come from phytoplankton. Yeah, so one, one thing that we've been exploring a lot in our lab is how, does, how do um, species interactions, so with daft, like for example, 
herbivore um, and their food items, so Daphnia and phytoplankton, as well as as Daphnia as the prey and, and insect predators as the predator, so these predator-prey interactions, how do these species interactions affect an organism's response to warming temperatures? And so to do that, um, for a long time we were trying to grow predator and prey in the same container. And because we want to know, like, how does living with a predator affect your ability to either to adapt in some way, we'll leave out the mechanism for now, to adapt in some way to warming temperatures. Like, is it that you're so afraid of the, you're so afraid of being eaten that you're, you're only focused on survival and therefore you, maybe there's not, the strength of selection is mostly on surviving and not so much on adapting to warming temperatures. So that's, this is a question that we've been interested in for a long time. And so, to do this, you have to grow the predator and the prey in the same container for a long time. And in general, when you do that, the predator eats all of the prey. <laughs> so your experiment is finished very quickly and there's no, there's no way you can measure evolution because everybody's dead. Um, so we experimented with different shapes and sizes of containers until we found one where we could grow this insect predator in the same physical space as the Daphnia. And, and luckily, it was just a very simple 750 milliliter glass jar that was kind of more long than wide. And the insect predator is called Chiabris, and it's also called a glass worm, I think, because they're transparent. And they love eating Daphnia. There's lots of experiments out there on Chiabris, Daphnia, predator-prey interactions. Um, so the Chiabris, in this 750 milliliter container, the Chiabris sort of floats at the top, and then all of the Daphnia hide at the bottom. But, but because there's just that little bit of space between the Daphnia and the Chiabris, they can actually coexist for months and months. And the Daphnia can reproduce, and they can have babies. Usually a lot of the babies die <laughs> because they um, haven't learned yet to avoid the predator. But yeah, we were really proud of figuring that out, how to grow these predator prey in the, and prey in the same um, container, because then that lets us run these experiments on you know, the effect of these predator prey interactions for responses to, to warming. There are a lot of things that I like about my job. I really enjoy interacting with undergraduates and graduate students. I feel like a lot of the really cool work that has been done in my lab has been done by undergraduates and graduate students. And actually the last two invited presentations that I gave, I talked exclusively about the research that was done by undergraduates in my lab. And it's, they've, almost all of them have been published um, so that's really exciting. I feel like, especially um, at this particular university, it's a really big university, and we have a huge <laughs> um, population size of incredible undergraduate um, students who are really excited to learn more and to, and to get some hands-on experience with research. Uh, the graduate students are really fun as well. They come with all these crazy ideas that we try to turn into um, master's theses or PhD theses. And they, I mean, I learn a lot from them. And everybody is coming to the project from a different perspective. And so when we put all these perspectives together, I find that it's a richer pro uh, project than it would be if it was just me sitting there behind my desk trying to come up with these ideas. Um, I also really like the intellectual freedom that we have we have a lot of flexibility as as researchers and as professors to design the projects and to do the research that we're really passionate about and so that i think is rare in outside of the university setting to get that sort of uh, intellectual freedom um, yeah those are the two things that i like the most by far. 